Okay, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at this morning, verse 18 through 22. I'd like to read that. Follow along with me. It says in chapter 3, 1 Peter, verse 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subject to him. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, as we approach this most difficult passage of Scripture, I pray, Lord, that you would give me liberty to explain the truths found here so we can get a sense of what it says For the very practical reason, Lord, that it would aid us during times of trouble, suffering, that we would know the plan of God and the pattern of Christ's suffering and what it accomplished for us. And I pray, Lord, as we do that, you may strengthen us in our heart and mind to become soldiers of Jesus Christ, knowing that we have and we are on the winning, victorious side of the cross of Calvary. Bless our time together now in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so from going through 1 Peter, remember the first section of 1 Peter, salvation, uh, because all Christians need to have a good understanding about what salvation is and that they are truly, honestly saved, that they know if they die today, they would go to be with the Lord. Secondly, the second section was submission, Uh, The different ways a Christian is to submit, coupled with the characteristics and attitudes for proper submission that is pleasing to the Lord. All right, and this third major section that we started last week is that of suffering. And by a way of wisdom, the Apostle Peter has laid the foundation for the Christians uh, to be prepared for any kind of trial or suffering that may come their way, that they would be able to stand firm in the truths that they know already and that have been accomplished for them by the Lord. And that means that all Christians need to grow in these truths in order to understand these first two sections of that of being uh, our salvation and that of submission. So then this third section of that of suffering will not be so uh, debilitating or confusing when those times come. So this third major section of 1 Peter has to, do with, has to do with suffering for the cause of righteousness. In other words, suffering for doing what is right. All right, that's, that's the, the simpli- simplicity of it. The Lord, so this Lord's Day, we will see how Christ suffered unjustly for the cause of righteousness, and that Christ's pattern of suffering was ultimately the pathway to victory. All right, that is very key uh, today, that what Christ did was the pathway to victory and to glory, that Jesus' victory is evident in the pattern of his suffering in actually three specific areas. And the first area, quickly this morning, is that of being victory of Christ over sin. 
And if you notice in verse number 18, look with me again, there's several, at least three things that come under this one, and it's this, that Christ suffered for sins once for all. Notice what it says, for Christ also died for sins once for all. Now that's in Scripture for a very specific reason, because Christ suffered for sins once, that is, his sacrifice was perfect, it was final, and therefore never to be repeated in history or in symbol again. Once for all offering of Christ stands in contrast to the annual sacrifice of the Jewish high priest on the Day of Atonement. The high priest's job was never, ever finished. They had to keep giving animals over to sacrifice for the sins of the people. It never finished. It was a very wearisome job. It was a repetitious work, year after year. See, Christ, at the fullness of time, in the consummation of the ages, that is when Christ came to earth to finish everything forever. That Jesus came to put away sin by means of his sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice was then an un, and is an unrepeatable event. According to Hebrews chapter 9, it tells us this, nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. So there... This is where Jesus was so completely different than the Jewish high priest. For it was not necessary for Christ to suffer again and again. He was able to get the real expiation of sin complete so nothing else needed to be done. That Jesus does not need to leave and re-enter heaven often that Jesus does not need to shed his blood often, that Jesus does not need to die often, that Jesus does not need to offer sacrifice of himself often, that Jesus does not need to come into the world as a man often. Why? Because he suffered for sin once. So when the reformers began to see this, they realized they could not participate in the mass anymore, the Catholic mass, because that was, again, a repetition of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which is unnecessary, all right? Or the scripture would not stress this so strongly, not just here, but all over the place. So how absurd it would be to make Christ do what scripture over and over said that he did once for all, like Hebrews 7, 27 Otherwise, he would have need to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's a pretty definite and strong uh, scripture to be able to convince us that we don't need to keep going back over some things. It's done for us. In fact, in Hebrews 9, 12, notice what it says on here. It says this, and not, that, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So in other words, Jesus Christ obtained eternal redemption for us by his one-time sacrifice. Therefore, why don't the Jews offer sacrifice anymore in the temple? It's because Jesus Christ finished the sacrificial system. He completed it. He fulfilled it. So no one has to do that anymore because Jesus Christ becomes the sin bearer. In fact, the, Greek, the three great truths that that were accomplished by our Lord found in Hebrews 10 where it says, first of all, that he, he purged forever. It tells us this in Hebrews 10 too. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers having 
once been cleansed would no longer have had consciousness of sins. And then that Jesus sanctified forever those who would believe, where it says in Hebrews 10.10, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and then he perfected everything forever in Hebrews 10.14, where it says, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So we get this finality about the, the cross of Christ, of what he completed on that cross was, was definitely for us never having to be repeated again. So that brings us to a second thing about under the victory of Christ over sin, and that's Christ suffered as a righteous man. Right in our text, it says simply this, the just for the unjust. See, Jesus suffered as the innocent one. I covered that in verses before. The unjust just refers to us, the ungodly, the unholy, the guilty sinner who had no chance of getting, getting to God apart from the finished work of Christ. And the just refers to Christ. where it says in Acts chapter 14, in verse, or Acts chapter 3, verse 14, but you disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murderer to be granted to you. In other words, Christ's perfect righteousness meant that he never deserved to die. He was not dying for himself. He was the perfect Son of God, the perfect man. But Jesus endured the pains of death on behalf of those who deserved to die. That's us. I like the way the writer, this one writer put it. He, the good one, died for us, the bad ones. He, the good one, died for us, the bad ones. So, see, in other words, the Lord died as a righteous man. And, of course, that leads to a third thing under this title, The Victory of Christ Over Sin, and it's this, that Christ died for actual, an actual purpose. Notice what it says in verse number 18, the end of the verse. It says, so that he might bring us to God. That's why he died. Why? Because no one else could bring us to God. We couldn't find our way to God. We had no directions to get there. See, this follows right on the heels of what was said already in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, where it says, For you were continually straying like sheep. Of course, that coming from Isaiah 53, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So, see, this is a universal need among human beings, that we have gone astray. We are wandering sheep, no direction, no one to look after us in this world, no one to protect us, no one to show us the way to God. But then the good shepherd comes on the scene, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the metaphor, because it's the, it points to the picture of wandering sheep, and wandering sheep have to be led because they are wandering in blindness. They are wandering in their own sinful passions and desires. They're caught in that vicious cycle of living according to their passions and desires. Now, if you notice on, in chapter 4, look down to chapter, on chapter 4 of 1 Peter, look down to verse number three, where Peter brings this to our attention, and he says in uh, 1 Peter 4, 3, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the, gen or the, desire of the Gentiles, that's really the, a way of putting the unsaved, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, 
carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. See, that's who we were before. That's what we did before, and we did that, of course, in ignorance. So our lives have been muddied and stained by sin, yet dead, wandering sinners have no way to remove that stain. For the sinner is unclean, polluted, as it were, by the filth of a transmitted sin nature and personal acts of sin. It is Jesus Christ, that has the power to cleanse it, that, that through Jesus we are washed from sin. It's like in, in the book of Acts where it says, wash away your sins calling on his name. It's the only way we can have our sins washed away because Jesus Christ did that in his one-time perfect sacrifice on the cross where he accomplished eternal redemption. So in this phrase that we are looking at here, so that he may bring us to God, that's the purpose. That's why he came. Because no one was able to get to God apart from Jesus Christ. There's an interesting connection to this particular phrase actually in the Greek culture. Because the Greek word uh, really actually means In the court of kings, there was an official in that court called a prosagoris. And this particular person was an introducer. That's what he was. He was a giver of access. In other words, this was his job. His, His function was to decide who should be admitted to the king's presence and who should be kept out. So once we, by repentance and faith, are cleansed of our sins by the sacrificial death of Jesus, that alone gives us access to God. That alone brings us to God. Jesus Christ, through what he did, gives us access to God. And may I just say, period. Nothing else can give us access to God. See, that's, so that's how, how, that's how we get saved. It's not by works, good deeds. Uh, that comes afterwards. We, we, can't, uh, we can't add anything to the cross that's already been done. We have to accept it as it is, what Christ has done. And then what happens is that there is victory over that. We have victory over sin. And that's when we can start putting our sin to death because of what he has done. Now, that leads me to a second point under the areas of victory, and it's this. The second one is victory of Christ over death. Now look at verse number 18 again, because at the end of verse number 18, it says this in chapter 3. It says, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So Something happened there when Jesus was put to death in the flesh. Now, that simply means, uh, the bottom line to that, is that he actually died uh, in the sphere of weakness. And what was the weakness? His flesh. He actually did take on a human body, right? He actually did come into the world as a real man. And that's, that's stressed in Scripture all over the place. He had to become a real man. So he can die on the cross. God can't die on the cross without taking on flesh. So this points to the very fact that Jesus did suffer a violent death as a human being. As it said already in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. See, the scripture repeats these things to get us some good theology about what God actually did. Now, if it was not for Jesus coming to this earth to submit willingly to the Father's will, we would all be without hope because we are sinners with nothing to offer God. Yet the Lord responded to sinful humanity with nothing to offer him by offering himself to them as an atoning sacrifice that Jesus came to earth as a man in the weakness of 
human flesh in order to redeem mankind from his fallen state and to regain mankind's destiny. And how did the Lord God accomplish that? Only by the design of Jesus' suffering and death could the grace of God save hell-deserving sinners like you and I. So ultimately, in that, the Lord had victory over death. And of course, this, this very famous passage of Scripture that we know well, connected to the resurrection chapter in chapter 15, where it says, but when this perishable will have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ triumphs over our greatest enemy. What's our greatest enemy? Death is our greatest enemy. Why? We can't win. Have you, do you know anybody who's ever won over death? The only ones is that if God's granted in Scripture, God himself overcomes death. So that means that gives us hope to know that you and I do not have to fear that death is the end and that death doesn't lead somewhere. It actually leads into the presence of God. He's, he's done this to bring us to God. Now that lends us to the, the next thing under this one, and that is that Christ was made alive in the sphere of power also. Notice the passage where it says, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So there's the power of God, that his body died, but his spirit lived. Yet the body of Jesus Christ was not left among the dead to rot in the grave. As the scripture tells us in Acts 27, and Psalm chapter 16, it says this, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. See, Jesus was entombed as one dead. He was dead. But no decomposition and no putrefaction, no flesh rot touched his holy body which lay in the grave. No, Jesus was made alive in the spirit, refers to the resurrection also, that it is the resurrection that divides Jesus from the rest of humanity. His eternal deity was, was strikingly and clearly manifested through his physical resurrection. In other words, the resurrection is what essentially makes Jesus different from all, all earthly would-be prophets and messiahs. They did not raise from the dead. Not a one of them raised from the dead. They all died, left in their decaying corruption, but not with Christ. He's risen, as Romans 1.4 says, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. So my friend, the resurrection enables us to see Jesus as he really is, who he is, that is God in the flesh. That is the good news. Without Jesus, there is no good news. There is no hope for everlasting life. There is no freedom from the slavery of sin. There is no being made right with God. There is no future ahead, uh, hope at all that you will enter into heaven and be with God forever without what the work that Jesus Christ accomplished for you and I. So that leads me to a third point, the victory of Christ over evil. Now, I try to kind of rush to this point because this is one of the most difficult passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. So it would be an understatement to say it is not difficult. It is very difficult. In fact, when I was reading through all the gigantic amount of material on this passage, there's probably around eight or nine, maybe ten interpretations of this passage. And 
uh, it seems like the commentaries sometimes don't even want to deal with it. They just go to the next passage, and they say, I, I don't know how to handle that. But anyway, I can't do that. I have to look at the text and see what it says, all right? And so that's what I want to do this morning, and I want you to look with me specifically at chapter 3, verse 19 through 22, because the first thing we see here is this, and I'm, I'm trying to give it a, a uh, title, that Christ's victory extended into the spiritual realm seen in his saving power. Notice in verse 19 and 20, and it says this, in which also he went and made proclamations to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now let me deal with that one first. And this is the passage uh, that I just read. That's the text that we're looking at this morning. So let's take a look at the passage. The incarcerated spirits seem to be the same ones Peter mentions in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. So take your, take your Bibles and turn over to 2 Peter, just a few pages there. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, and notice what he says there. And of course, the question you want to ask too is why is this event repeated here in Peter and then in 2 Peter, and then also it's an event that comes up more than once in Scripture in a very powerful way. In 2 Peter 2, verse 4 and 5, it says this, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, something definitely is going on pre-flood, that is very devastating to the world. And so it's brought up here, it's brought up in 1 Peter, and of course I want to look at what, what exactly are they talking about when they bring these vents up, because of course Peter is writing in a way where they already had knowledge of this, so he doesn't go on to explain it. And of course we have the rest of the Old Testament to explain it, so I want you to take your Bibles this morning, because I have no room on uh, the screen to be able to put all the passages, but Genesis chapter 6, let's all turn to the first book of the Bible, and I want you to see some things in Genesis chapter 6. In verse number 1, So in Noah's day, I'm not reading yet, in Noah's day, something happened that got, caused God to bring about this catastrophic worldwide flood and then incarcerate a section of very powerful fallen, I believe, spirit beings or angels. So let's look at verse 1 of chapter 6 of Genesis. It says, now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, now that sons of God, many believe that that means angels. Now that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Verse 3, then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with men forever because he, has all, he, he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. And then in verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. And when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. So that means there's sexual relationships going on here. Uh, 
it seems with some kind of angel beings and humans, and, and then it says those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, of course, another translation of Nephilim is giants, but some believe that it was also giants thrown out of heaven uh, that became uh, part of the population of Palestine because even in Numbers it tells us that uh, there we also saw Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight so we were in their sight. In other words, we, were, we looked small compared to how gigantic they were. They were powerful human beings. So according to this passage and according to the epistle of Jude, these Nephilim were fallen angelic beings also called sons of God. And these fallen angelic beings are said in Scripture to have left their proper abode and went after strange flesh, that is, cohabitated with human women to produce a superhuman race. Now that sounds unusual, doesn't it? But it does tell us in Scripture that the Lord did something. This is a, this is, this is a catastrophic event. Look at this passage of uh, from Jude, what it says. It says, angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode. That means the parameters of their created being. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them since they, in the same way as these, indulge in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in the undergoing, in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So, summing that all, all up is uh, this seems to be a sinister plot of Satan to contaminate the human race, by involving the birth process. Again, this is no mistake that often Satan does want to mimic what God would do, right? And of course, what would he mimic? Well, remember what happens. Mary becomes supernaturally pregnant when the Holy Spirit of God came upon her which brought about the incarnation of the Son of God. See, that was a miraculous thing that happened. So this diabolical plot was overturned when God sent a universal flood to wipe out this contaminated seed. The only ones who escaped this gross, abominable, accused practice was Noah and his family. Now just get that for a minute. Something was, has drastically gone wrong in the human race where only eight people could be saved. So what was going on? Well, if we think of these things, then we see that this definitely could be the reason from Scripture. And in, of course, Genesis chapter 6, verse 11 verse thir- to verse 13 says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. Notice how many times corrupt is used here. And the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh has corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. So in other words, that sin had so much abounded with all the demonic activity that was going on in those days that God could do nothing but send a worldwide flood and wipe everything out. Now, who was Noah? 
Noah was, it says in Scripture, found favor in the eyes of God. And it says that Noah was a righteous man and that Noah walked with God. And the length of time Noah labored and preached was a long time. In fact, the Bible tells us he preached for 120 years for the very purpose of giving the world of people time to repent and believe Noah's message. Of course, when we look at our passage again in 1 Peter chapter 3, remember, look what it says there in verse 20. It says, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. See, Noah challenged that unrighteous generation in his days that was filled with violence and completely corrupt with his message of salvation and warned them that if they continued in unbelief, that divine judgment would overtake them. Where it says again in 2 Peter 2, verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So the reason why Noah's faith condemned the world is because what he was told by God, as yet unseen, came to be, in every last detail to this unbelieving, corrupt, violent world. Here is a personal righteousness of Noah contrasted with the godlessness all around him. For it says in Genesis 7-1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, and you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. So his faith condemned the people all around him who disbelieved God and disregarded the warning. No person responded to his faithful example and his righteous preaching. And the only ones, it says a few, eight persons were brought safely through the water. So after showing you all this, as quickly as I could, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I think you can see more of what the Apostle Peter is communicating. As far as Jesus' proclamation to those fallen angelic beings in Noah's day. Because here's the scripture again, and I want you to I stress the word proclamation there. For it says, and... In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits. Now, the reason why it's translated spirits is that it, you usually don't use this word to refer to human beings. Uh, it's used here to refer to angels, angels that are now in prison. So pre-flood, that event that happened, God had to had to do something about it. it brought the the worldwide flood there, and it says that he made proclamation, went back either between his death and resurrection or after, whether in human spirit or not, I don't know. But he went back and he made proclamation to them, those spirits, those demonic spirits that corrupted humanity. See, their diabolical plot and transgression not only put the whole created world and the whole human race, race in jeopardy, but also God's purpose of salvation by grace in Christ Jesus to mankind. So Jesus went, Jesus went to the place of imprisonment of these fallen angels, of course, also called Tartarus. Now, back in the scripture in 2 Peter, if you notice what it says there, it's on the screen, it says, if God did not spare Angels, when they sin and cast them into hell, that's the word Tartarus, all right? It's also translated Hades, and it's also translated hell. Now, we know that Tartarus, Hades, and hell is a permanent place that departed souls go when they die, all right? The permanent place that is 
it dumps out into is the lake of fire. We find that in Revelation chapter 20, right? Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, right? So it empties out until the final second death, eternal death, there where there's no chance to be saved here. And what Jesus does is that Jesus makes proclamation to them. And what does he, what's his proclamation? Well, it doesn't tell us what it is, but if I could put the story together, it could be something like this. Jesus could have said in the beginning of time, when you evil spirits sought to sought the utter corruption of the human race, you tried to usurp my plan of redemption, and you corrupted the people that were on the earth. They did not submit to Noah's preaching. They did not submit to my authority as Lord. And your motive was to undermine my plan for humanity and take over. Then thousands of years later, I have patiently worked the plan of redemption submitted to the Father's will, humbled myself by being obedient to the point of death and even death on the cross. Well, I'm here to proclaim to you, I won. I came to proclaim to you that Christ's proclamation following his death slash resurrection was a victory proclamation. It is when the king when a king won a battle, what he would do is he would take the other king before they put him to death and put his foot on his neck and say, I won. I won. You lost. And they would usually end up killing that king. So Jesus, by his finished work, sealed the fate of these disobedient spirits, thus bringing them into final subjection that Jesus is now exalted to the place of sovereignty as one of many passages of scriptures that say this. It says, and when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through him. See, that's what Jesus did. So by Jesus' atoning death, he defeats Satan and death where it says in Hebrews, and through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So the power of Satan has been rendered inoperative by Christ. That Satan's power of death has been annulled for those who are united to Christ in his death and resurrection. And Satan's authority to condemn and punish forgiven sinners has been made void because... For them, God has already judged, condemned, and punished all their sins in Christ Jesus. There are other New Testament passages that show that Satan was disarmed. Satan's weapon, the executing of eternal death on sinners, was removed for all those. For it says in John 12, verse 31, Now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. So that is what was taking place, and that's why the Lord made proclamation. And then we come to this next passage of Scripture in John, uh, excuse me, in 1 Peter, and that's that Christ's suffering was also a type. Notice what it says in verse 21 of 1 Peter chapter 3. It says, corresponding to that. That's how the translators translated it in the New American Standard. But actually, it is the word that means antitype. It's like the stamp and the die, right? One is kind of the shadow, and one is the actual event. One is the shadow, one is the actual event event. So in other words, this term connotes the exactness of correspondence between the stamp and the die. In other words, let me say it like this before I read the passage. Baptism, as it mentions here, is a symbol or a symbolic picture 
of the resurrection of Christ. Now, look what it says in verse number 21. It says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Now, what the problem is that some people stop right there, and they assume that baptism uh, saves, but that's not what it's saying, because if you notice the next part of that passage, it says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Right? So in other words, don't get stuck on the phrase, baptism now saves you, because neither water nor baptism can save. The act itself does not save. As our text says, it cannot remove the filth of sin, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. See, baptism does not function as an automatic rite of forgiveness and spiritual cleansing. It must be accomplished by some form of response to God. So what saves, again, is it says in our text, an appeal to God for a good conscience. And what's that? Well, last week we looked at this passage of Scripture in Hebrews where it says, let us us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's regeneration. That's being born again. So we have been cleansed and forgiven by being born again. We are at peace with God only by the blood of Christ. Only then can we have a restored relationship with God. So, see, this the risen and reigning Christ saves and is the basis of our appeal to God. Water, baptism, if it's talking about water, baptism uh, represents all of this. And what is the representation of baptism? Death burial, and resurrection, right? So that, that is the whole culmination. That's why there's no such thing as an unbaptized believer because uh, it goes together. It's part of the package of salvation that I believe in Jesus Christ and then I am at becoming to union with Jesus Christ by submitting to that first step of obedience and that's to walk into waters of baptism and proclaim that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, and I'm not ashamed to proclaim that and then to live for him the rest of my days. So again, in our text, in verse number 21, if you look there, it says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right in verse number 21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. So in other words, it is ultimately by the resurrection of Christ that one is saved. So that becomes where it's all heading. The shadows of the Old Testament point to the very thing that seals and accomplishes and finishes what Christ did on the cross was he raised from the dead. So just just as God provided an ark to provide salvation for Noah and his family as a type of Christ. And just as Noah saved through water, so the believer is saved through through and by the virtue of Christ's resurrection, that God has provided salvation through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. One translation uh, has put verse number 20 like 21 like this and I quote that by the way is what baptism pictures for us in baptism we show that we have been saved from death and doom by the resurrection of Jesus Christ not because our bodies are washed clean by the water but because in being baptized we are turning to God asking him to cleanse our hearts from sin. That's a good way to put it. So the bottom line would be, for someone who is being insulted in the context of 1 Peter and persecuted and suffering for righteousness, because they are a Christian, they are to be well informed of something, and that is to be cognizant 
that Christ has overcome death and Satan by his death and reigns victorious over all evil forces that could hold power over his children, like sin and evil and evil spirits and death. So Christ's victory went to the ultimate place. And it would be this, and the last thing, that's Christ's victory extended into the highest realm to show his sovereign power. And the last verse, look at verse number 22, 1 Peter, all right? It's this, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subject to him. So, in other words, it's telling us, where does Christ reign right now? It says he's at the right hand of God. Having gone into heaven, he's already there. In fact, other passages say that Jesus is sitting. Why does it say he's sitting? Well, a king usually does sit, but it also means that Jesus, as the high priest, no longer go through all the standing. You know, there was no chairs in the tabernacle. The reason why is the priests had no time to sit. Right? They had no time to do any of that. They had to keep working and working. Now Jesus Christ sits down after the work is accomplished. Jesus assumes the position of authority. And of course, that is in the perfect tense, meaning that it still is taking place. And then where is he at? He's at the right hand. And what is that? It signifies the might and majesty of deity. Sitting on the throne at the right hand of the king indicates he who sits there along with the king, Jesus, the son, to bear the designation that is equivalent to saying that he is the ruler of the universe. There is nothing that is not under the rule of Christ. And then a last thing that we see here is this. That Jesus, who, who does Jesus rule? Well, notice what it says. It says this, after angels and authorities and powers had been subject to him. Who has all the authority? Jesus Christ. Over what? Over angels and authorities and the power, powers. They're all under his subjection. Right? Whether they like it or not, it's not willing suggest, subjection on their part. It's what, it's what is because of what Christ has done and who he is. In fact, a passage of Scripture that you and I are, are familiar with is this one in Philippians, where it says in verse 9 through 11 in chapter 2, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone will confess that someday. So in staying within the context and flow of 1 Peter, the pattern of Christ's suffering led to victory. Our victory. Our victory is over sin. It's over evil. It is over evil spirits. It is over death. So Jesus suffered injustice for our salvation. Jesus satisfied the justice of the Father and was vindicated by his resurrection in that the Father accepted his offering for the sin of the unjust, and that means we are vindicated. We are on the victory side. Therefore, when a Christian is being persecuted for their faith in Christ alone, for their obedience of doing what is right before God because they know it pleases him, and for their refusal to participate in the sins of society, we can find comfort and com contentment in the middle of our trouble by reflecting thoughtfully on the ultimate vindication and victory we have in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That Jesus' sacrifice was so perfect, was so final, was so sufficient 
that it gave to all who believe a permanent justification before God and a continuous position that cannot be altered before God that will be enjoyed forever. See, that is what God gives us. And because he gives us that, all things that could happen to us on earth are paled to what God has already done and what we are to look forward to in glory. That's where we're heading. We're heading to glory. We're heading to the presence of God. And I pray that as we consider that, that you and I would be sober-minded and desire to walk holy and righteous in this world. And if it need be that we suffer for what is right, so be it. God knows you're going through it, and he will give you all you need to go through it, but he's already given you stuff now. He's given you the understanding of what he's done. Nobody can take away what God's given you. Nobody. No demons, no power, no government, no person. They may take your life, but they cannot take your soul because your soul is secure forever. And someday you'll get a new body anyway. These are going to go to the grave and die and decay, right? But someday we're going to get a new body, and we're going to be with Christ forever, ruling and reigning with him on earth, I believe. And then in the eternal state, we'll, we'll be with God forever. There'll be no separation between us and God. The new Jerusalem comes down, and there's nothing that separates anyone from God anymore. God will be our God. We will be his people, and that's the eternal state. All theologies end there. All of them do. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, I pray, Lord, that this passage of Scripture would uh, resonate in our minds during the week, the months, the years ahead. For, Lord, we, we want to rest in these things because you are so awesome and great. And, Lord Jesus, for what you accomplish is, is so final and, and, and complete that, Lord, we can just rest on what you've done. You are the one who leads us to God. You're the one who keeps us here on earth. You're the one who's going to bring us and come and get us uh, to take us to your side. And so, Lord, we, we so much uh, want to thank you for these things. We are so privileged to know that this is in the word of God and it's always been there. So I pray, Lord, as you bring these things to our mind today, that we, you would never allow us to forget them. Let us meditate on till we think through these points of theology and it becomes part of our thinking and our decisions. It would move our will to make the right decisions. So, Lord, if we have to go through something, uh, some punishment because we're doing what's right, I pray, Lord, at that time, at that moment that you would give us everything, at that time that we need apart from what you're already giving us. And I pray all this this morning in the great and awesome name of Jesus Christ. Amen.